Today on the Coral Ridge Hour, generations have been raised on a strict diet of Darwinism. But new discoveries are leading growing numbers of scientists down a different path. Creation is easily as scientific and in fact more scientific than is evolution. And then, Tom DeRosa was a staunch evolutionist and agnostic until a job interview changed his life forever. Hear this remarkable story of transformation today on the Coral Ridge Hour. From Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, this is the Coral Ridge Hour. Despite all the efforts of ancient alchemists, none were ever able to turn a base metal like lead into gold. But our almighty God is the great eternal alchemist who turns all the dross of our lives into gold. The alchemy of God, the alchemy of grace, all things work together for good. In his newly republished book, Turn It to Gold, Dr. D. James Kennedy tackles the difficulties we all face. Contact us today to receive your copy of Turn It to Gold, one of Dr. Kennedy's most beloved and inspiring books, so that you can be encouraged or share assurance with a friend that God's promises are the richest gold now and forever. 
Today on the Coral Ridge Hour, Tom committed his life for teaching the theory of evolution, the inspiring story of this man and the miracle that changed his life forever. But first, Dr. Kennedy's message. Today's message takes us to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and Duquesne University, where I was invited to speak a number of years ago at the prestigious International Conference on Creationism. This is a gathering of experts from around the world, scientists and others, to discuss the critical issue of creation versus evolution. It was my privilege to be one of the keynote speakers on the topic of evolution and you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Russ, for those very kind words. For a moment there, I wasn't sure whether I was 10 feet tall or six feet under. <laughs> Someone said that there are three kinds of people. There are those that make things happen, there are those that watch things happen, and there are those who say, what happened? <laughs> I'm afraid that the majority of people fit into the third category, but you do not. Evolution and you was my topic for this talk. And my friends, the seeds of secularism, grounded of course in evolution, have been and are producing a most pernicious and deadly harvest in America. I read just recently an interesting illustration of that by Dr. Ernest Gordon. Now, Dr. Ernest Gordon is the Dean Emeritus of the Princeton University Chapel. He's also the hero of the Bridge Over the River Kwai. He was the man who discovered the New Testament and was converted and was used to bring about the conversion of hundreds of other soldiers that were in captivity there. And when the movie was made, all of that was omitted. But he is a great man and a great hero, recently retired as dean of the chapel of Princeton University. And he said something which I think illustrates the results of this very, very aptly. Listen to him. Dr. Ernest Gordon, quote, during the late 50s, I was invited to address the senior class of an English department in a city high school. When I arrived at the school, the late 50s, I introduced myself to the assistant headmaster whose office was at the entrance. He guided me to the appropriate lecture hall. 20 years later, I was invited to the same school for the same purpose. I again presented myself to the same office, but it was no longer the habitat of an educator, of the assistant headmaster. It was a command post of police, of the police inspector. Corridors and classrooms were monitored by police officers who reported regularly to the inspector. The reasons given for the change were obvious. Violence, assault, rape, drug-induced madness. I interpret this scene, he says, as evidence of the end times of a civilization that had once benefited from the Christian worldview, one that had exalted creation and people and provided the ideals essential for an authentic education. I recognize that civilization does not create Christians. However, the community of faith created and still creates the civility that is the evidence of civilization. 
That demoralized school is the tragic consequence of a society's rejection of the biblical worldview that provided the intellectual dynamic of Western educated education. What is education but an expression of the prevailing culture? That is, I think, a very dramatic presentation of the bitter fruit of the materialistic evolutionary view of our time. Now, the Western Christian view of man has always held that man is here for a purpose. The Christian view has been summed up in the catechism question, what is the chief end of man? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. But the evolutionists would not question whether that is the chief end of man or some other end, but would say there is no end or purpose or teleology in any man's life at all. Now, my friends, when you get rid of purpose, you also get rid of meaning, and you get rid of significance. If something has no purpose, what do you do with it? You throw it out. We have seen in the courts four very significant decisions that have ushered us into this secular apocalypse that we are now which we now find ourselves plunged into. There was, first of all, the decision of the Supreme Court that ruled prayer out of our schools, and then they ruled the Bible out of the schools, and then they ruled the Ten Commandments out of the schools, and now they voted negatively against the balanced treatment of creation along with evolution. So we have seen that banished from the thought of our young people is the idea that they have been created by anyone, that there are any laws or moral absolutes which they should obey. And by the way, in that decision where they ruled against having the Ten Commandments posted on the walls of the schools in Kentucky, in that decision they said, lest looking upon them from day to day, the students should be moved to obey them. Ah, alas and alack, we couldn't have that. And of course, if there is no creator, and we just arose by some spontaneous chance concatenation of amino acids in some primordial slime, if there is no creator, then there is no judge. And if there is no judge, then there is no one to whom we are accountable or responsible. If God is therefore dead or absent from both ends of the process of life, then it is true, my friends, that as Nietzsche said, anything goes. And that's one of the basic motivations that lies behind the rush to evolutionism. Well, what has 130 or so years finally given to us? It is interesting that at the same time, during the last decade, when America has been rushing through court edicts more and more into evolution, at the same time, the basic pillars of the evolutionary faith have been collapsing all around them. And many, there are many people that suppose that perhaps the evolutionists really have proved their case. And today, we have evolutionists saying that we don't even have to present evidence anymore. Evolution is a fact. It is not only a fact, it is the most thoroughly proven fact in all of science. Nonsense. Dr. Crick who, as you know, was the co-discoverer of DNA, which is the master control of all of our genetic development. 
and which is also that double helix, that spiral that contains all of our genes, is the most complex molecule known to man. And it is so fantastically complex that Dr. Crick decided to apply probability science analysis to the probability of DNA arising by chance, randomness, and of course the the god of evolution is a trinity of matter, chance, and time. And those are the threefold gods of the evolutionist religion. What was the chance of DNA arising by random chance in the entire history of the world? Uh, the supposititious history, according to evolutionists, which is supposedly 4.6 billion years. Well, he applied the science of probability to that question, and uh, it turned out that it was zilch. That's not a scientific expression, but it describes it very accurately. Uh, he got the message very clearly. And uh, this was so devastating to him that what that said, in very simple language, is that not only could a human being never have evolved naturally and spontaneously in this world, in the entire history of the world, but a single living cell could never have evolved. But beyond that, one single molecule within the nucleus of that cell, the DNA molecule, could never even have evolved naturally in the entire history of the world. All of which says that everything that you and your parents and grandparents and children have and are being taught about how life arose spontaneously in some ancient sea is baloney. And uh, Dr. Crick, being honest enough to accept that, However, being an atheist, he wasn't willing to accept creation, so he invented a whole new theory. And as one scientist said, there are two requirements for inventing evolutionary theories. You should know what they are, two requirements. Now, you might wonder just where one goes to get this great intellectual capacity to do that, but here they are. One, it depends on your ability to weave a tail. And two, it depends upon the credulity of your audience. Well, with both of those in mind, he came up with a doozy. He calls it directed panspermia. And the idea is very simple that since life could never have risen here naturally, and since there is no God, which he assumes a priori, therefore some advanced race living on some other planet, revolving around some other sun somewhere out there, or maybe it was there, <laughs> sent spaceships out into space containing their sperm cells, and voila! Here you are. <laughs> now, that is simply a lengthening of the shadow. A lengthening of the shadow while you remain in the dark of its penumbra. In logic, it is called an infinite regress. And of course, it is completely without help in solving any problems, as you can see. Because to any thinking person, the question is going to automatically arise, where did that advanced race of people come from? Well, you see, there was this other, more advanced race of people that lived on another planet. And excuse me, sir, where did they come from? 
Well, you see, there was a much more advanced, and on and on it goes until you finally exhaust the credulity of your audience. However, shortly after that, another scientist of equal or greater fame, Sir Fred Hoyle of Cambridge, decided to examine the possibility of a living cell arising spontaneously, not in the 4.6 billion year history of the Earth, but in the entire history of the universe, which keeps changing from year to year, by the way, and uh, roughly 20 billion years on the outside. And uh, so anywhere, here or on that planet or on this one or any place else, anywhere, even to the entire beginning of the universe, one single living cell somewhere. And he applied the science of probability analysis to that and concluded that the chances of that happening were one to the 40,000th power. Now, most people are not used to thinking in terms of power, and I realize I have a, a vast array of scientists here, but I am encouraged by the fact that there is also a larger array of non-scientists and laymen that are present, and for their sake, may I simply say that another uh, evolutionary scientist, uh, Le Comte de Noue, a Swiss scientist, Nobel Prize winner, who is an expert in uh, probability science, said that anything whose probabilities are less than 10 to the 50th power will never happen. And of course, 10 to the 51st power is 10 times that many. And 10 to the 52nd power is 10 times that many. And 10 to the 53rd and 4th and 167th and 2,900 and keep going to 40,000th power. Do you have any idea what that means? Evolutionists like to have a long time for the age of the Earth. Fine. <laughs> How much would they like? 10,000, not enough. How about 10 billion? 10 trillion. 10 quadrillion. 10 septillion. 10 octillion. 100 million billion trillion times 10 whatever. And do you realize that the figure I just gave is not a tiny fraction of 10 to the 40,000th power? All of which very simply is to say that it never, ever happened. And Sir Fred Hoyle of Cambridge, one of the world's leading astronomers and mathematicians, the father of one of the only two widely accepted cosmogonies of this 20th century, the steady state theory, which lost out in the popularity contest with the Big Bang, but nevertheless, to be inventor of such a thing is quite an accomplishment. And uh, he and another mathematician, Chandra Wickramasinghe, did these computations, and they said, that to suppose that somewhere on this earth, by purely natural, spontaneous, random causes, that the entire complexity of the living cell, with all of its amazing and unbelievable complexity, that this came into existence by chance, is nonsense of the highest order. Sir Fred Hoyle, what your children are being taught as scientific fact and truth, he says, is nonsense of the highest order. My friends, evolution is dead coming out of the starting gate. They rang the bell, lifted the post, and the horse dropped dead. <laughs> Thank you.
One of the most damaging results of Darwinism, according to Dr. W. R. Thompson of Canada, who was the head of the National Institute for Biological Control, one of their most outstanding scientists, so much so that he was selected to write the introduction to the centennial edition, 1959, of Darwin's Origin of Species. He was a scientist of that kind of stature. And Dr. W. R. Thompson said that one, by the way, he also said that one of the results that accompanied Darwinism was a decline in scientific integrity. And how true that is. We find suddenly the rise of all sorts of fraudulent activities taking place in science. But he said the most damaging thing that it did was that for the first time in the history of science, science had been separated as a result of the followers of Darwin, what finally resulted from it until we come today, that science is now conceived as totally separated from God, for which, which was never heard of before in science. Today it's almost accepted as a commonplace that a creator cannot be conceived and tolerated in the whole scientific discussion. In fact, um, it is true that uh, during the Arkansas debate, one of the people that testified in that Arkansas trial said that uh, he was reading one of the creation science textbooks and uh, threw it into the trash because it referred to a creator. And now suddenly, if there is any reference to God or to a creator, then somehow this has now become unscientific. And science has been redefined <clears throat> as something which excludes God. Well, that raised a very interesting question in my mind. If it mentions a creator, you throw it in the trash. Do you have the ground rules? Do you understand how this is played? You get a book, and it mentions a creator. Had anything to do with the creation of the world, you throw the book in the trash. We all understand now how the game is played. Let me read you, then, the last paragraph of Darwin's Origin of Species. Quote, there is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers, having been originally breathed by the Creator into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. A supposed scientific textbook bringing in, of all things, a creator. Into the trash it goes. But you know, it is encouraging that the truth is getting out and the number of people becoming interested in and becoming convinced of the scientific evidence for creation is growing at a phenomenal rate. Just since four years ago, there has been a tremendous number of more people who have become aware of the truth, that they have been fed fairy tales and that they have been deceived even as Dr. Colin Patterson, the chief paleontologist of the British Museum, said that he woke up one day and suddenly realized that he had been deceived and deluded into thinking that evolution was a proven fact. And he asked himself one morning, what do I indeed know about evolution for sure? 
Now, this is the chief paleontologist of the British Museum, which has the largest collection of fossils in the world. He said, nothing. And he asked a whole group of evolutionists meeting shortly thereafter at the Field Museum in Chicago, can any of you tell me anything that you know for sure about evolution? Silence. Finally, one man raised his hand. Now, this is a world gathering of evolutionists, and they don't know anything for sure about evolution, <laughs> which, of course, is the best proven fact of history, of the history of science. One thing I'm sure of, Dr. Patterson, we ought not to teach it in high school. We're teaching it in kindergarten. But the truth will out, and I am sure that the day will come when evolution will be recognized to be the pernicious and harmful theory and falsehood and deceit and fairy tale that it really is. And people will realize at length that it is a great and glorious creator, the almighty, omniscient God, who has created the world and you and me. May it so be, and may it come soon. Thank you. The landscape of the debate between evolution and creation is changing dramatically. Young people are going on the offensive, challenging professors of the old guard with the facts. Right now, I want you to meet a man who is helping us empower people, young and old. Whether you look at the universe and look at the stars and see how magnificent they are, they all obey the same laws. These laws are universal. So who in the world would create these laws but an infinite God? In times past, Tom DeRosa would never have recognized God as creator. Tom was an absolute devout evolutionist. He would talk about us coming from apes. I departed the ways of what I was taught as far as the scripture was concerned, as far as God was concerned. And I started to look in terms of the worldview as Darwin and evolutionists would look at it. Although Tom DeRosa had been brought up in the Roman Catholic faith and considered becoming a priest while attending junior seminary as a teen, his perspective shifted after he went off to college and was challenged by a friend to read Charles Darwin's controversial book, The Origin of Species. And at that point, I started to question, uh, really, if the Bible is true, then how can I accept biology class? After college as a young teacher, Tom quickly rose as a leader in the public school district where he was working and devoted himself wholeheartedly to teaching what he believed was the ultimate in scholarly science, evolution. We just focused on the fact that kids had to hear evolution because that was true. And they needed to be taken away from the crutch of God and believing in God. Tom had become an atheist, and his passion for teaching evolution became his idol. But that passion began to fade when the school district where he taught made some drastic changes in the science program. They took my science away. The school board voted that we're, instead of having a full year, we're going to have a half year of science. It was the summer of 1978 when Tom began to reconsider his teaching career. During that period, a private school in Fort Lauderdale was in dire need of a physics and chemistry teacher. I knew nothing at all about Tom DeRosa. <laughs> Dr. Ken Wackus was the headmaster of Dr. D. James Kennedy's Westminster Academy, a school dedicated to teaching biblical principles and creation science. When they called me up, they said, Tom, do you know of a chemistry and physics teacher? Can you recommend one? And I carefully thought. And after a while, I couldn't think of one right offhand. And I just 
said me. And I thought, oh my goodness, what is he doing now? So I got off the phone and he said to me, I'm going to Westminster Academy to interview. And I think it was in a week or something uh, for this job. And I said, you, you can't do that, Tom. You're an evolutionist. I said, why? She says, do you know that this is a Christian school? This is Dr. Kennedy's school. This is Westminster Academy. This school is well known. You have to be a Christian to teach at this school. I said, well, doesn't mean you sign a piece of paper? She said, no. So I called everyone I knew, and we set up prayer chains to, to pray for Tom that day of the interview. Just that, you know, things would go well. So when I was in the office with Dr. Ken Wackus, he told me what a Christian was, and I was expecting to hear the same thing. But for some odd reason, he told me that a Christian was one that believed in the free gift of eternal life. I think what got to him was the understanding for the first time perhaps in his life that you don't work your way into the kingdom of heaven. It's not by being good. It's not by being religious. I was always taught that I had to work, work, work for your salvation. But the fact that Jesus Christ paid the penalty for me and I didn't have to do it was an amazing concept. We just prayed together and he out loud asked Christ to come into his life. He sounded different. His, he just was a new, a new person. I just, he was not the man I left in the morning. He was someone brand new and on fire. That very afternoon, Tom had Ken Wackus present the gospel message to his wife, Linda, also. And I thought, boy, I thought I had been a Christian all my life. <laughs> I was pretty wishy-washy. And so we prayed together, and there was a couple reunited now for the first time in Christ. So it was a brand new family. Jesus Christ was now Tom and Linda's savior, but the question still remained in Tom's mind of whether God was his creator as well. I thought I could believe in evolution and I can believe in God. But as I read the scripture and heard Dr. Kennedy from the pulpit, I came to the conclusion that that was impossible to do. I couldn't believe how he was just so hungry for the word, it was just, Amazing, he got up in the morning, he had the Bible, and he came at night and he had the Bible in his hand. He was always reading it and he would read it to the kids and he would tell the kids things that, there were things in the Bible that I didn't know about. That fall, Tom began to teach chemistry and physics at Westminster Academy with great zeal. When I was hired at Westminster Academy, I thought it was very unique that Ken Wackus would hire me. I wouldn't even hire myself. Dr. Ken Wackus became a close friend and a mentor in Christ. He wanted to read everything we could possibly give them. He attended all the classes he could attend. It's like a humongous sponge just soaking up the ocean dry. He was that eager to learn. And it was in that context that Tom began to develop his ideas and saw the mistakes that he had held to originally and became a confirmed creationist. I came to the conclusion that there was overwhelming amount of evidence to support creation whether it be the fossil record being so incomplete, whether we look in terms of the complexity of life and look at living organisms and see that they are totally masterpieces of work. It was through teaching and learning about creation science that Tom developed a new passion to share the creation message beyond the school walls. That's when he formed an organization called the Creation Studies Institute in 1988. He knew how many students were being taught in ignorance and how many teachers out in the colleges and universities and high schools of America needed to hear from one of their peers another side of the story. Then he just felt a passion given to him by God to spread the message. As Creation Studies Institute continues expanding each year, Tom has met with many challenges, but in 2002, Tom would confront his greatest challenge ever. God just brought Tom physically to the point where he couldn't even stand up in a classroom anymore. I was called to the emergency room after some testing, sh sh symptoms of shortness of the breath. I went to the doctor. They told Tom that he was in total kidney failure. He had no kidney function left, that he would need a transplant. We were absolutely shocked. Tom's family stepped forward to donate their kidneys, but not one of them was a match. Tom would have to be placed on a waiting list. I was rather a worrywart in those days, in the very beginning. And Tom said to me one day, why are you worried? 
God is in control. God will take care of us. And I'm going to, I'm going to get a kidney. And he just said it so matter of fact that I said, you're right. And I stopped worrying. I look at this illness or the fact that I had this illness as just a stepping stone for God to do more wondrous things. A mere acquaintance of Tom's, Joe Pettit, a deacon at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, felt led by God to donate a kidney to save Tom's life. Surprising as that is, Joe was tested and found to be a perfect match to Tom's kidney. It encourages me that it seems as though Tom's body is accepting the kidney well. It encourages me that Tom is able to actually continue in the ministry that he was involved in. In a matter of a year, less than a year, I was back in service again, and this time, rather than being a full-time teacher at Westminster Academy, I was serving God now as the executive director of Creation Studies Institute under Dr. Kennedy. If God never used me in any other way, if it was just Tom DeRosa, the story has been so phenomenal that it would have been worth it all. I have a new vigor in my life right now. The fact that God has marked this time to say, let everybody hear that I'm the creator of this wonderful universe. Despite all the efforts of ancient alchemists, none were ever able to turn a base metal like lead into gold. But our almighty God is the great eternal alchemist who turns all the dross of our lives into gold. The alchemy of God, the alchemy of grace, all things work together for good. In his newly republished book, Turn It to Gold, Dr. D. James Kennedy tackles the difficulties we all face. Contact us today to receive your copy of Turn It to Gold, one of Dr. Kennedy's most beloved and inspiring books, so that you can be encouraged or share assurance with a friend that God's promises are the richest gold now and forever. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.